This is a 1955 Crown Fire Coach number F1048. She was originally Montebello Fire Engine number two until she was sold to Seal Beach Fire Department in 1979 to be their paid call fire engine. When Seal Beach Fire Department disbanded, it was contracted to Orange County Fire Authority and it remained in service with them until 2005. In 1984, it was repowered with a Detroit 6V92 and an Allison automatic transmission. She has a 1,500 gallon per minute pump and a 500 gallon water tank. Today, we get to cruise her through the streets of Ranch Cucamonga, California, out at my training company, Red Helmet Training, with Mark Davidson. I'm Jess Quinalti, and welcome back to another episode of Firefighters in Fire Trucks Getting Ice Cream. Hi, everybody, how you doing? Uh, Jesse Quinalti from Firefighters in Fire Trucks Getting Ice Cream, and uh, we're out here at Red Helmet Training, um, my training company in Wrench Cucamonga. Uh, and we're gonna hang out with Mark Davidson from Fairfax, Virginia. He was here at my place uh, teaching small unit leadership, uh, crew resource management, uh, crew dynamics, all that kind of cool stuff. And uh, he got to come out from Fairfax, Virginia to this great weather while it's uh, snowing back there at his place, uh, just to kind of talk about that. Uh, he's here as part of our Learning From Leaders program. Uh, we're doing a big name every month for the entire year of 2021 for our 10 year anniversary. So Chase Sargent from Buddy the Boss, Reggie Freeman, Mike Galliano, Pete Van Dorp, Phil Jost, Steve Prizerbowski, uh, all coming to Red Helmet Training, uh, Jared Sergi. So if you're in Southern California, come on down, it'll be awesome. But right now we're gonna go talk to Mark and just do some cool, cool uh, leadership uh, stuff. Uh, so stay tuned. All right, pulling up to get Mark here. We have a good time here. What's up, buddy? Nice. <laughs> What's up, bro? This is right. a ride. <laughs> this is you ready to get some ice cream? Yes, I am. This okay, is a ride. Let's go. All right. Well, well, well. You got your door shut. You good? I, I'm good. <laughs> uh, this is. You just gotta find some. I gotta get the smile off my face. Oh my gosh, it's so <laughs> rad. And where I can I, I get one of these? The uh, I don't know where you get one of these. Uh, you don't have one of these back in your place. I right I don't. Well, I, I'm talking about from my house. So I won't. Oh, you're over your house. <laughs> okay. Well, let me. I'll talk to a guy that knows the guy. Yeah, knows yeah, the guy. yeah. I'll drive it home. If we yeah. can work this out, I'll drive it home. Somehow, uh, it's pretty amazing for this show that uh, guys hand over the keys to their prized possessions for me to go cruise them around. So That's a beautiful thing. Nice little yeah. old crown fire coach to go, you know, get some ice cream in. You can't it, go wrong with that. Uh, this is this is awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. So, you're at Red Helmet Training yesterday. Uh, yep. We got to have you teach some uh, group dynamics and small effective unit leadership, right? Yep. So. Yep. Uh, what's that all about? Like, what's the what's the big thing you're doing out there to, with the uh, with that kind of stuff? Well, I, I I spent some time in the military, then come into the fire service, and what I see fairly quickly is kind of a disjointed what I perceive to be this disjointed approach to leadership. Uh, you know, my perception of the fire service coming in was you know just like the military, they train for leadership and they have effective leaders and. You know, firefighters are awesome. Right. And not that that isn't true, but what I saw fairly quickly was that there really wasn't the same uh, training and education pipeline that the military has for training for leadership. And I, I, I got to experience the uh, ripples in the pond from that and, and saw that this is, there's something not right here. And my first three, four years on the job, I 
I'm a troop, I'm not really, you know, I'm not going to solve any problems. But it was constantly in the back of my mind, you know, why, why do I see these issues with, with leaders? And uh, I always had in my head that there's a connection between the military and the fire service. There's a, there's a significant kinship right. and a lot of overlap in, in the, you know, concrete nature of the mission and, and uh, the environment we operate in. And uh, finally had an opportunity to give a voice to that and put some thoughts on paper. And that's, that's been, uh, I think, the, my passion right now is talking about, hey, how does the fire service develop uh, that leadership, especially at the small unit level, the company right. level, which is really where the rubber meets the road. Now, how long were you in the military and what branch? Uh, eight and a half years, bottom line, uh, in the Marine Corps. Uh, okay. Act eight years active duty, about six eight months uh, in the reserves. And to what rank did you end up going up to? Uh, staff sergeant. Okay. Left out as a staff sergeant. So in the military, you had a there was a system in place to go through leader fellowship, actually, right? Yes. Starting a fellowship and going through leadership. So Absolutely. What were some of those steps that they they consider those steps to go through that leadership program? Well, it, it starts literally in recruit training, in basic training, where you're taught about being an effective follower. And, and that may seem obvious or, or like, well, yeah, that's what basic training is. But uh, getting somebody to understand their role and how they fit in that role is not just follow orders. Uh, in the Marine Corps, you're taught 14 leadership traits, like within days of, of arriving there. In some cases, you know it before you get there. Right. And that idea of teaching even the newest employee of the organization 14 leadership traits may seem a little odd because you're like, hey, they're, they're just a private. They're just the, the newest member of the organization. Why do they need to know about leadership? Right. And that is what establishes very quickly an understanding of followership and leadership because particularly in the military, your move into informal leadership and then formal leadership can be very quick. And given uh, you know, a set of circumstances, it could be rather immediate. And if you haven't laid down that foundation of what effective followership and leadership looks like, uh, you're, you're going to fail. And so that, that idea alone to me was a, an important connection to say, right. we, we really didn't do that. Recruit school in the fire service was drag hose lines, listen to whatever the officer has to say, that's all you need to know. Right. So, uh, in class the other day, you talked about the uh, the connection between the fire service and the military yep. going back to the Civil War. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how did how did you come across that, and you put it in your class today? Well, uh, it, it starts out with a small piece that I got of uh, out of essentials when I went through. So, whatever fifth edition or whatever that was. And they had a small reference in there to the Civil War and firefighters. So fast forward 15, 20 years later when I'm really starting to dive into this and do research and find out what I can and how do I apply it in the fire service, I, I actually had to search for that because I couldn't remember where it was at. But that's what started that thread of understanding that actually the American fire service and the American military uh, reach a crossroads in, in, in the Civil War. And it starts with the, the United States Army saying, hey, we need soldiers. And, and you know, we, they're gonna recruit from anywhere. They're gonna draft anybody they can get. But one of the areas they specifically identified as a, an important cohort was firefighters. They're looking around at people that have uh, great physical courage, who know how to follow orders, who can operate under high stress. And, you know, when you look at Philadelphia and New York and these, these firefighters that are, that are there, they drafted entire cohorts of regiments, the uh, Fire Zouaves from Philadelphia, the Excelsior Break, uh, Brigade from New York. And uh, even to the point where at the Gettysburg Battlefield, there is a statue, a monument to that connection between fire service and, and the, the, the soldier. Right. So that, that nexus to me was important, but more critically coming out of the Civil War, when now these firefighters that went in they're largely decimated. They're not, they, you know, they, they, died, they died in battle. But now, as peace breaks out, the fire service, the cities are looking, hey, where, where do we hire firefighters to protect our, our, our citizens? Right. And 
hey, let's look for somebody who displays great physical courage, can operate under stress. <laughs> right. And, and well, they're coming out of nowhere. So now uh, the fire service is largely drawn out of these veterans coming out. And it really begins for the American Fire Service, this paramilitary structure, which in large measure didn't exist before the Civil War because we were based on the European fire model, which, right. you know, even the supervisory structure, there was a foreman. That was the term, the legacy term. And uh, it was interesting, just the other week, uh, we found out that D.C., uh, up until the 70s, referred to their supervisors as foremen. Right. So that legacy continued. But that transition for the American Fire Service into that post-war paramilitary structure, to me, was just fascinating because, you know, you fast forward to now, and the fire service in, in large measure has a, feels a kinship to the military and respects what they do. The military respects what we do. And that, that was part of me looking at this. Well, if there's this kinship, if there's this connection, if there's this historical perspective, if all these things align, why why are we not learning from them? Why aren't we right. doing some of the things, not all the things, right. but, but <laughs> right. some of the things that we can learn from them, why are we not doing that? And it just seemed, at the time, it was like that, oh, wow. Right. But the more I look at it, the more, the more critical I become of why haven't we done this? So that connection is where it starts. Yeah. Well, and it's uh, it's pretty funny. That's why you talked about like uh, all the firefighters now. It's the reason why they have a thousand blue shirts in their yes. closet. Yes. Because of uh, who ended up winning that war and where, yeah. what yeah. the uniform became. You know. Yeah. No, I, I jokingly talk about that because again, going back to before the Civil War, based on the European model uniforms, and you look at a courier knife print from back in the day blue, green, there was purple, there was orange, all these light right. colors, flourishes. Uh, leaders would wear ostrich feathers in their hats. And uh, I submit that our battalion chiefs should wear that on the incident scene. <laughs> it would make it much easier to right. find it, much better than a vest. That's right. I, I, I want us to go back to that. <laughs> but again, post-Civil War, I, I can say this jokingly, you know, winning side gets to pick blue t-shirts, blue uniforms right. become the, the, the standard as you come out of that. And, and that, uh, simply put, that's why we have a thousand blue t-shirts in our closets. <laughs> Anywhere in the country, every firefighter has a thousand blue t-shirts. Right. So that, that connection is there also. So now as you go through the ranks uh, in your organization, you become a lieutenant, you start looking for ways to do an officer development program yeah. in your organization. And this was from the ground up, you built that. Yeah, that's the interesting part, and, and that's one of the biggest reasons that I feel so strongly that officer development is not just the, a big department kind of thing uh, or a jurisdiction with a lot of resources. Uh, the, the, the way we evolved into it was from the ground up. It, 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 this was not a top-down solution. We, there was a, a group of us with this idea of how do we do this, and there's a really long narrative, but the short story is as we uh, started teaching the state classes and then over time uh, we we made this connection that wait if the state can teach teach the state classes why can't we teach the state classes the way we want to at the same time there is a group of us who I was very fortunate I, I, I cannot claim the, the, the lead on this but there was a group that had started a leadership development program based on a state program and it, right. and we adapted it to the needs of our region uh, the Northern Virginia Fire Rescue Leadership Development Institute, and I'm a proud uh, plank owner of that program. And we we looked at the lessons learned from that and what we could do, and then all that kind of morphed together to kind of, to some seminal moments that I had in my experience where I was looking at our organization saying, why, why are we not doing this? Why, hey, here's this crazy idea. Let's train our officers. Let me just get really wild and outside the box and say, let's let's do that. And um, it, uh, it all, very fortunate that the, the organization bought into it. Uh, it. It took a while for us to really get up to speed and, and get that buy-in, but it truly was a ground-up approach that has, I, I think, is serving us well, and, and I think other organizations can truly model. So, uh, and now you're getting to the point where you bring in outside people to assist even building that even bigger to get some other perspective? Yeah, very, very important because it's that classic story 
And, you know, I don't say this to demean anybody, but, you know, sometimes leadership is, uh, there's some analogies to parenting. That's a leadership environment. When you're a parent, you're in a leadership environment. And at a certain point, you tell your kids all day long, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And they just start to, ah, yeah, it's the old man. He's full of it, whatever. Right, he doesn't know anything. He, what does he know? He, right. Yeah, whatever. But then they have that moment and they come to you and say, oh, Uncle Charlie or my best friend or I saw this thing on TV or the movie star said this. And in your head you're going, I said the exact same thing. Right. So that, that critical idea of sometimes it does take an outside perspective. Uh, the, the fire service is built around the idea you cannot be an expert within 60 miles of where you work. You, right. you've, got, you've got to go outside. And that, that, that's, that's why I'm going to come to Fairfax and teach for you. Yeah, because, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so I'm not an idiot here. I can go out there and be an idiot there. <laughs> and I'm out here. Yeah. <laughs> right. so, I'm the idiot that brought you out here. It's all working out. So, yeah, having those outside voices and even the inside voices not just relying on just our fire officers, our command officers, our firefighters, even within uh, the, you know, our, our civilian uh, members, within, right. you know, the HRD personnel, we bring them in. The county members from civil service, from HR, uh, alternative dispute resolution, we, we have engaged them because we yell at the civilians who drag a green line into the house what do I know about HR? How can I teach HR? How can right. I teach conflict resolution? So let's engage uh, those SMEs, those people who know. And so our classes start to look a lot more like a seminar or almost like a conference right. where we're just bringing in all these different voices uh, to speak on the topics that they know. And at the same time, from a student perspective, keep things not stagnant, not the same voice. So it's. Uh, the approach, uh, I, I feel, has worked, and, and our members uh, understand that the product that we built is is better for them in the long run. And, and we end up waitlisting uh, our folks, even though the amount of time and effort they have to put into our classes is significantly more than than other typical certification right. classes. And we were talking about the other day, like, so I mean, you're familiar with my strategy and tactics for employee fires program and, yep. and it's kind of cool what you guys do is you bring in uh, some theatrical yes. role players to, that can cry on command like you were talking about yeah. that yeah. Uh, help out with your class so so critical the, the the piece with what you've done and the approach that you're taking for us we we do it but at a a much simpler level like we just draw some analogies because for our for our target audience for our members who are you know, God bless them, display physical courage every day, do things that people literally make movies about. Uh, when it comes to dealing with people, it's all, it's like this whole different world. That's, oh, that's people, that's quote unquote soft skills, that's right. Dr. Phil, you gotta, ah, I don't wanna deal with that, <laughs> right? But putting out a fire or saving a life, yeah, I can talk about that. Well, right. let's make that jump a little simpler. Instead of saying that's this whole different world, Let's draw that analogy to sizing up a structure, doing a 360, talking right. about creating flow paths. And, and to me, uh, and you don't write my evaluation, so I'll just say it, you've done this next level of taking every aspect of that. We've done it at a very, I think, basic right. level to, to draw some of those, but uh, to take it to that next level and have those discussions about the tactical side of our business, and, and really make now the leap to understanding how you deal with people much simpler, I think is, is important. Because then there's not this huge wall, this huge step. It's a much shorter step to say, oh, so when I talk with my employee who's in crisis or in conflict or that there's an issue, I need to do a, an assessment. I need to do a 360, if right. you will, of the employee, just like I would of a structure that's on fire. Right. Yeah, you do. You don't just charge in through the front door because, oh, there's fire somewhere in there. That's, that's, that's the failure. So being able to, to bridge that has been a, a big deal. And, and I honestly think that what you're doing is going to help that more broadly. The other part for us that's been important is that aside from making those connections at that level, is that even with the role plays, 
we talk about uh, sets and reps in a tactical environment as key pieces of being effective on the incident scene, right? And we train the hell out of our people with that, you know, the fire studio, you know, uh, videos, pictures, burn this house down. Yeah. And um, at a certain point, that's great. Well, why are we doing those sets and reps on the personnel side, with, right. the, with the people side? How can we, we would never send out a new unit officer without a, a significant amount of those tactical sets and reps. But when it comes to people, uh, you, you'll figure it out. It'll, it'll be fun. Well, it's, I mean, it's the, it's the reason why it's the busiest class that I do, because a lot of our officers don't have that training to deal with the employee problem, you know, the employee fire. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I know that we've talked about this a ton, you know, but what you're doing with the role player stuff is, I mean, that's huge. It's been, and, and again, this is where there's kind of several things that came together, but the approach we're, we're using is the one that came out of the LDI program. And just to give full credit, that was an extension or an evolution of the state program, which is called the Virginia right. Fire Officer Academy, which was, was groundbreaking, it was groundbreaking. And for us to then take that, that piece about how they do uh, conflict uh, management and, and personnel scenarios and have dissimilar role players who the student is not doesn't know come right. in and act as that's much different than just turning to the student act them and say oh act angry or act sad or whatever yeah. it puts them in tension right away when somebody comes in they've never seen them before and they're the scenario is is that they're having suicidal ideations well that when that that member who's in that role can cry on command or have that affect about just feel and, and feel that and you it right and I uh, one of the things that we want to still do is do some metrics do some measurement of heart rate uh, blood pressure and, and, and <laughs> now respiratory you're taking rate. A whole other level. yeah no we, we've talked about this we we're, we're looking at at some point doing that when they do the tactical scenarios and doing that when they do the personnel scenarios I feel that the, the theory is that they're going to be very similar. The stress right. curves, the, right. the, all those things should align very closely. And if we can make that connection, that'll be a big deal too. So that's another thing on the radar of, yeah. of the 85 things we want to get to. <laughs> this is my old station right here. Oh, oh, awesome. Oh, wow. That is awesome. Not too bad. I and like then, it. Uh, this building up here is actually the original fire station. I'll, I'll show you when we make this right turn. Oh, this is nice. Is this still RC? No, this is Upland now. Upland, okay. Yeah. Beautiful. And then that, the building right here in the middle was the original station. Oh! That is, that's beautiful. What's it now? Did they turn it off? Uh, no, we were trying to turn it into a fire museum, and now there's a there's a law office in there right now. Oh, okay. So, oh, they gotta go. Oh, hey, can we do this for like the next couple days? <laughs> just drive day. around. I'll say, just drive around, wave at people, enjoy the sunshine. <laughs> That's the best part about this. You just drive yeah. this whole rig and you wave at people. Oh, this you is. Know? Oh my God, this is spectacular. Now. uh like even just not even just uh crying on command but like you're talking about the stress reaction like yelling yeah and it's it's funny originally like those employee problems we're just doing it as a simulation it's a game yes right right and when it's done you see the the officer candidates come out of that thing and they're just like i just wanted to punch that guy and yes. it's like it's just a game just relax yes walk through the process right. and right. uh yeah pretty funny yeah well and, and we talk about because we have by the time we get done our candidates or students are sitting there they're sweating their their hands are shaking that stress reaction is identical to what happened on the incident scene and their ability to manage that emotion is so important because what we don't want on a tactical event is somebody who sounds like they're being chased by a bear right, right. we value that when somebody marks up yeah, I'm on the Charlie's side and you go know, cool common collective well then, again, carry that over to the per personnel side, the people side. If you're in stress and you're breathing fast and your hands are twitchy, 
right. you're, you're, you're not in control of your own emotions and then that by extension means you're going to overreact you're going to react more strongly and and that sets a tone for the leader so all that that ties into it but to your point we've had uh, scenarios where the the candidate was angry with the role player days later like they were still visibly angry and we had to talk to him and say you do understand that he was playing a role right you and, right. and the, that's and again imagine that in the firehouse that leader who's hanging on to that with the support and that that truth and that's so critical just to right. and to be able to put that in a, a real world context and again those are the exact equivalent of tactical sets and reps that's they, there, there's no difference Right. Yeah, no difference. And, and for us as a fire service, not to value that and not to invest in that, I think is part of a, a, our failures that, that we have to change. It has to change. Well, that was the reason why I took all of the stuff for employee counseling and tried to apply it to fire ground yeah. terminology. Yeah. Trying to make this as simple as easy, you know, give them a tactical worksheet, if you will, like, hey, how are you going to save your employee? Let's go. Yes. Let's go through Recio. Yeah. How do you rescue them from themselves? Yeah. Who's the exposure? Who else is involved? Yeah. How do you can find the fire to the smallest area possible? Yeah. And sometimes I'm just happy if I can just contain that fire to my battalion. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Like so, <laughs> can find the fire. Yeah. Yeah. How are you going to extinguish it? Yeah. You know, and and uh, the, that slicer stuff we talked the about, slicers. like Very applying awful. water, yeah. social power. How can I apply social power? Like how well do I know them? Right. Right. Legitimate power, the bugles that you have, coercion, uh, reward power, expert power, you know, you have to be able to know what's appropriate at the time to apply. Like what's my best way to get them to understand? Like this is the standard. Right. We want to bring you up the standard, not lower the standard to you. Right. Right. Yeah, no, it's it, it 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 makes it significantly easier for our members to get over that hurdle about emotions and uh, you know empathy and and communicating. Like all these are all words that make our, our members very twitchy. They're like, oh, I, I gotta be you know, I, no. I, all I gotta do is put out fires. Yeah, and, and to draw those analogies and the one I'm. Uh, just I use constantly is if you have a trash can fire do you just sit there and wait till it becomes a five alarm fire? No! You put water on it immediately and as a leader engaging not waiting, not sitting back not being conflict avoided but immediately engaging and if we were in a commercial doing a walkthrough, a pre-plan of a, a, an office building and there was a trash can fire there we would clearly not just go Ah, it's not too bad. I'll deal with it later. Right. No, yeah. we would immediately do something. <laughs> yep. And and that same thing applies to our people. When you see that moment. Hey, how you doing? 55, right? I don't know. Yeah, 55. Yeah. I'm talking it's 55. <laughs> yeah. Is this a siren? Is this a siren boy? Uh yeah, of course. <laughs> ah. Now? <laughs> I gotta find a siren break now. <laughs> I saw it for a second. There it is. <laughs> That's funny. If we get a chance to add on to something, I'm in. Uh, that's all I'm saying. I, oh, I get to the we'll, siren we'll, we'll, on a second. We got some gear in here. The pump works. I got helmets. We, we, get, we we'll can make, make some work. magic happen. Yeah. But yeah, that, that that idea for our our leaders to know that in a firehouse, what you're doing is setting the foundation for the fire ground. And and if you look at those small situations, go ah, it'll be okay. They're they're adults; they can talk it out. Or oh, right. that little comment that they that that uh, that member said. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't mean it. No, no worries. Right. Well, well, he or she said it. And uh, no, you, you're basically that's your trash can fire. You had a chance to put a cup of water and make it stop and you take a pass it, right and it will display itself at some point I just firmly believe that what happens in the firehouse eventually displays itself on the fire ground it's the fire ground any incident right and when you allow that dysfunction to occur it's just a matter of time it's just a matter of time
Well, and, and like you said, if you don't put out those small fires, they just become large fires. Yeah. So yeah. you got to constantly just monitor that yep. and uh, keep going through the process. Yeah. But uh, so I'm trying to drive and talk here. Yeah, yeah no, you're good. <laughs> you're good. We got to keep it between the ditches. That's what That's I've it. always said. Now I'm going to go opposing because I didn't turn it in the right spot here. Let's see. Okay. You know, and it all leads. The funny thing is, it all goes back to that recognition prime decision making as well, right? We teach those officers how to make decisions on the fire ground based on stuff they've saw before, but right. if they've never dealt with an employee conflict issue, you know, or all they have to do is go back to reference to what they do with their kids, you know, the, you know, that's not going to work very long, you yeah. know, when you just, yeah. well, I told you so, or yeah. don't do that, yes. or because I said so, you know, it, it only goes so long before that's not going to work. And, and like you said, that that the, the firefighter is getting tactical sense and reps every day. They're observing their leader, they're modeling behaviors, they're seeing these events, and they're able to then make those connections to what success looks like. Right. But they're not dealing with the personnel side of it. That's they, that when those things occur, they're behind closed doors, or or potentially if they're not, they're not seeing necessarily good behavior. But that's what training's about. Training and education is exactly what supplements or makes up for a lack of experience right and again that's the failing of the fire service luckily i got somebody from the film crew backing me up it works out really well <laughs> safety is no accident that's it you ready to go get some ice cream yeah let's get some ice cream <laughs> i'm up This is handles since 1945, so even older than the rig we're driving. Nice, but, uh, nice. Yeah. Can we do this the rest of the day? That's all, man. Just say it. I, 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 I'll, I'll open Eventually, it up. Eventually, I got to get you back to Virginia to see your, your wife, your fire chief. I'm sure she'll understand. I don't know which one wants you back home more, your wife or your fire chief, but yeah, we'll figure that out. So, uh, Hello, how are you?